Um, if you didn't get an outline, we have them back there. Um, that'll help you follow along with the message. So our message this morning, the title of it is, and we're talking about dominion. We've been talking about dominion for several weeks, and we're gonna we're gonna look at knowing the Father as sons and daughters. And the Bible calls it sonship. And let me just say this, and just by way of introduction, this has nothing to do with the message, but it, and it, and it kind of does. Um, a few months ago, we had the privilege and honor to um, have lunch with uh, Steve McVeigh. And as we were talking to him, we both were sharing that he was he's coming from um, a place where he used to be in his theology, his understanding of God. And as he continues, he's growing, he's changing, he's fine-tuning his understanding of Scripture and the Father, the Godhead, the Trinity. And so he was talking to his wife about, I don't know, i got these books out there. And some of the stuff that's out there, I don't believe. They're still out there. They're being bought. They're being sold. They're being read. But some of the stuff that I wrote, I don't necessarily believe right. You know, believe in that. I've moved on because of illumination. I mean, we all don't know the truth right now. If we all got the opportunity to write a book, do you think in about a year or two you'd look back and go, oh, I don't know if I believe that or not. I've, I've, I've kind of moved on from that because of illumination. I mean, if, if we know everything today, we don't need a teacher. We know it. But we need a teacher, the Holy Spirit, because we don't know. Paul says we look through a glass darkly. So we don't see everything clearly. We're evolving, in a sense, in our understanding of God. And I said, I'm glad you said that, talking to Steve. I said, because I've got 800 plus videos on YouTube. And they go clear back to 2012. And if we still had audio, I could take you clear back to 2006. But I said, some of that stuff I go back and I'll look at what I was saying. I'm like, oh my God, I said that? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, do I take that off? Do I leave it on? I, 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 I mean, because to be honest, today is fresh manna. Last Sunday is old to me. I'm, I'm, well, what's next, Lord? What do you, how you, you know, you're going to keep opening my eyes and I'm going to, you're going to keep fine tuning this thing. And um, so yesterday's message is old manna. As soon as I'm done with this this morning, as far as I'm concerned, it's old man. I'm hearing for the next thing and the next leg of what he's saying and doing, and it could it could change the way I think. Um, if there's truth, I'm gonna I'm gonna gravitate to it. So it's, that's why I would really hate to have to write a book. Honestly, I really would. I mean, it'd have to be Christological and that Jesus doesn't change, um, Trinity based because that's the trinity and grace oriented but other than that i mean we're the church is all over the place we've got 40 plus thousand different denominations today and then you've got the cat that's protestants then you've got the catholic church and then you've got the orthodox so there's all kinds and we're not tied to any of those we're just like we're the body of christ okay and we're tied to the head that's Christ, and we're getting our revelation by the Spirit of who He is. That's why Paul, when he went to churches, he said, I determine nothing but Christ and Him crucified, because that doesn't change. So, um, and the reason why I say this is because I got an email from a guy who's, um, I don't know where he's from, he didn't really tell me, but it's out of country. I'm thinking it's over in the, I really don't want to say that, but, um, and he was saying how much he's enjoying the messages, not how he came across this. But um, he wanted he wanted the notes from the last two Thursday nights, which I did send to him, and um, and then he just emailed me back. Uh, I don't know if it was last night or this morning. I just saw it this morning, where he um, has the opportunity to preach to undergrad students um, wherever he's at, and um, so we've got people listening. And I wanted to say, you know, just don't go back too far. I'm telling you, you go back clear back in 12, 2012, 2013. I was a rebel. I mean, I'm just telling you. It's some crazy stuff. And and so getting back to Steve, his wife said to him, you know, where you are today may not be where people are. Maybe they'll read that book and need that and then get that's their entrance into 
So you kind of like, well, maybe they get to see your evolution too. So just, I say that as a disclaimer. I don't believe a lot of this, not a lot, but some of the stuff. I would never act like that, like I do today. I'm older, more mature than what I was back then. Um, just when you watch something old, just consider all of that and give me grace. All right. All right. So we've been looking at the prodigal son and looking at it from different angles. What does the prodigal son have to do with dominion? You've got two boys working on the farm. If you got your outline, you're going to see that the farm represents the kingdom of God. The two boys represents those who are, one who's in the church and the other one who doesn't go to church. And then you've got the father who represents the father God. And so what we have is a problem because both sons do not know who the father is. And they're working for a father. They don't know who he is. One is the one who stayed on the farm sees him as a tax taskmaster, and he's in a performance mode, and he's working for everything. The other one doesn't recognize the father to the degree that he's like, I'm out of here, give me everything, and I'm, and I'm going to go do riotless living. And so the whole the whole scheme is if we don't know the father, we can't do the work. All the work done on that farm is wrong if they don't know the father. I don't care what the work it is, how dedicated. That dedicated they are to the work if they don't know the father's heart their motive is going to be all wrong they're going to be doing it for the wrong reason and so they have to have a better picture and the story that Jesus gives us in Luke 15 is that both boys do not know the father but in the story the father gets unveiled to both of them of who he truly is and um, but then we'll get into that here in a little bit so what I want, what I want you to see is A.W. Tozer said if the worship is wrong this is in his book, Whatever Happened to Worship. In his book, he says, if the worship is wrong, the work is wrong. If people don't understand who God is and worship the Father out of the revelation of who he is, and all we do is get people saved, introduce them to a big businessman in the sky, we give them programs, we give them all kinds of things to do, but they never have an intimate relationship with the Father. They have a work ethic with the Father. They come to church. They, they, they get involved, but they don't go beyond the, the, pre, the presentation of the church to really understand who the Father is and get into relationship, which is worship. And so Tozer said, if, if, if the worship is wrong, and that's their understanding of the Father and what they worship with out of that revelation, then the work is all wrong. And that's what happens here in the story of the prodigal. The two boys don't know who the father is. The work may be right, but the business will suffer for it because the work ends up being wrong. So the church and humanity is suffering along with creation because I think today we don't necessarily, and even if we do have a, a, con a right concept, we're still looking through a glass darkly, and that's why we come here that, to have Christ unveiled more and more. And that's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 1. Look what he says here. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace. Now look, verse 16. Why did God do verse 15? Because of 16. To reveal, and that word can be used unveil, to unveil his son, Jesus. And where is Jesus? In him. So when Paul hears that, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me on the road to Damascus? He's hearing, he's hearing a voice, and he sees a light, but Christ is already in him. Let's read 15 again. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. This is before he started persecuting Christians. Paul had, God had already separated Paul, called him by grace, not by what he did or didn't do, but by grace, to reveal Jesus who is in him. Christ is in all and fills all things. And so Paul realizes, we'll look at Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives within me. So the, the purpose of a preacher, teacher, pastor, whatever, is to teach from the Bible in a way that Christ who's in you gets unveiled. Church is in a separation mode. You see God up there, you're down here, and you're working for a God up there to get him to do something for you down here. When in actuality, he's in there, and all you need to do is be awakened to that, and then it gets manifested through you. 
So that's what Paul is saying here. Well, this is the part the two sons. They don't know the Father. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to unveil the Christ who's in you, that you're one with in union. See, the work's already done. That's why he says it's finished. So we don't have to add to anything. We just have to be awakened to what he's already done. And once we see it, we become it. You become by seeing, right? By beholding. You become by beholding. Okay, let's look at Luke chapter 15, verse 31. That's my introduction. Let's go pick up where we left off last week. In Luke chapter 15, 31, now remember the story. The son comes back. The prodigal comes back, God, and, and the father puts a ring, puts a robe, puts sandals, hugs him, kisses him, kills the fatty calf, makes a celebration. Party's going on. The older brother isn't happy with the way the, the younger brother's getting treated. And so the father goes out there to plead, please, please come in. Welcome your brother back. But he won't have it. And then he said, I've stayed with you all this time. And you've never given me the fatty calf. So obviously he's had his eye on the fatty calf. But the way he says it is skinny goat. This is what he basically said. You gave that boy who took all your inheritance and squandered it on prostitutes, riotous living, and he comes back and gets the fatty calf. I've been with you all this time and you haven't given me a skinny goat. Not even a skinny goat. Not even the worth, the worthless animal on this farm. You didn't even give me that. And this kid does what he does, this son of yours, and you give him the fatty calf. And you celebrate. You never made a party for me. I ain't never heard no party going on for me. And I'm the one who never left. Look what he says here in verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 31. The father says back to his son, you're, with, you're always with me, and all that I have, what? Is yours. <clears throat> really? You, 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 you could have got a fatted calf and thrown a party any time. Everything on this farm is yours, and you've been waiting for me to give it to you? See, that. I don't know how that boy's going to respond. We don't have the story laid played out to what he says back. But can you imagine this boy has been working for these things and they were already his? Right? Is that what it says? And, and that goes, and I've seen people take that to, to now that everything, believe it or not, I heard this. And again, they, it, it's, it's like the, the older son mentality in the church is going to tell you that the older son was right because I've heard this. That he didn't say that to the younger one. So the younger one's going to come back with nothing. He's got the ring, got the robe, got all that. They missed that whole point. That he's been restored back into the family. Meaning that all things is the prodigals as well as the older brothers. Whether he squandered it or not. He's still, what, whatever I have left is still yours. And he says, the older brother, what I have is yours. Both boys can eat a fatted calf every day if they wanted to. And have a celebration. Because... All things are yours. Let's look at it again. Son, you're with me, and all that I have is yours. Now, the church has become the older brother in that we have people working for things that's already theirs. Like, let's take healing, for example. You can go out to any Christian bookstore, and the top ten books you're going to find that you've got to do something to get healed. Rather than see Jesus as already the healer who's in you. So your eyes have to be opened to the healer that's in you, and then the healer heals. And there's no work to be done because he says, by your stripes we were, past tense, Peter, were healed. Isaiah, are healed, looking forward. Peter, looking backwards. It's a finished work. Deliverance. You're already delivered. So the church has us on a performance treadmill to get things that's already ours. The infamous story that, or the analogy that Watchman Nee uses is, let's say somebody comes into this church and they walk into this sanctuary and they say, uh, Greg, uh, can I talk to you a minute? And I'm like, yeah. He said, I'm new here and I, I really need some help. I said, okay, what do you need? He goes, I need to know where the sanctuary is. And I'm like, you're in it. You're, you're already in it. You don't need to get there. You're already in it. 
He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I need to go where you guys preach, teach, and worship. Where's that place at? Where's the sanctuary? I'm like, this is it? Chairs? Stage? I don't know what else. How do you convince somebody that they're, that, that they're in a room they're already in, that they're trying to get in that they're already in? How do you convince somebody of that? You can't. How many times do you try to talk to somebody, you give them plain, simple truths out of the Bible, and their eyes get glazed, a deer in the headlights, and I just, we just had this happen yesterday, and I said, I'm, you cannot convince a blind man what the color blue is. You could give them all the scriptures. If their eyes aren't open, it's the blind leading the blind. And only God can open the eyes. And when the eyes get opened, then they'll be able to receive the truth. But until their eyes are opened, I, they're blind. You know? So these two boys at one point, if not the older still, are, is blind to the Father's goodness. And we're blind to the fact, the church, that we already have all things. He said, everything I have is yours. Let's look at the next verse. Let's just play around with this. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with some spiritual blessings, but the rest you've got to work, work for and earn by prayer, fasting, this, that, going to church, giving, all that. you gotta, you got you to grease God's hand. To get something back. No, no, no. It says we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Already yours. So that means you can enter into what Paul says labor to enter into what? Rest. We can rest in the finished work and know that all things is ours. You can't have dominion if you don't know your inheritance. Because you need your inheritance to have. But he says blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Look at the next verse. Peter. 2 Peter 1.3 As His divine power has given to us and that given if you go to Romans 8 33, 32, 33 it says He's freely given us all things. Freely. Freely, 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 freely given us all things. All things are ours for free. You don't got to work for them. Okay? His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to what? Everything you need in life is freely given to you. Everything you need regarding godliness is given to you. Along with Paul, blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Okay, through the knowledge of Him, and you get this stuff by knowing Him. The more you know Him, the more the inheritance opens up that you can believe for, and that you're awakened to, that's already been yours before the foundation of the world. Next. 1 Corinthians 3, 21, 23. Therefore let no man boast in men, for all things are yours. We need to, you need to do a, a Greek word study on all things. And you don't need a degree, because all means everything. You don't got to be a scholar to know that all things means everything. So he says, all things are yours. Isn't that what the, he said to the prodigal? Son, everything I have is yours. Paul is echoing that. He says, all things are yours, whether, whether it's Paul, Apollos, uh, Peter's, or the world, or the world. The world. Abraham is called as, a, as an heir of the world. I mean, how, how, how many messages you heard on that? We are heirs of this world that we are supposed to have dominion in. Right? So he says an heir of, 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 of the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. So you've got to get the spirit, your spiritual eyes open and say, you know what? Everything's mine. Now, Lord, how do I now steward this on earth as it is in heaven? How do I do it? And the Holy Spirit is the one to lead and guide you into manifesting all that. But you don't, you can't be a beggar. Those two sons can't be like the hired men. We're acting like the hired men. It's not ours. We've got to work for it only if the Father lets us have it. That's the hired men. Right? There's a difference between the hired men on the farm than the two sons. The two sons, he says, everything is yours. The hired men, he can't, he won't say that to. 
So they're going to sit there and take the crumbs off the master's table while the boys get to sit at the table and feast on everything that's theirs. We're, we as a church have been, have been taught and lied to and deceived out of our sonship into the hireling mode, the slave mode. And anytime someone tells you you've got to do something to get something from God that has not been already freely been given in Jesus, now you're in a hired mode. Now you're going to be working as a slave for something that's already yours. And that's the older brother's mentality. He's been working for stuff that's been his all along. And can you imagine how, like, oh my God. And it's only because two things. You don't, I, I, I don't know who the older brother, his name is, but if his older brother's name was Joe, I'd say, hey, Joe, you don't know who you are because you don't know who the father is. Once you understand who the father is, you, Joe, will understand your sonship to the father. And you know what it is? He loves you and all things are yours. Now, take that and work the farm. Work out of your identity. That's what we've got to do. Let me ask you a question. What did Jesus lack while he walked this earth? Show me any time, place where he said to the disciples, can't do it, we're limited. Money's not there. They won't let us. we got to go do something else. We're not doing anything today because there's no money. Is that, is that, do you see where Jesus is limited in any way? Or do you see him overcoming every obstacle that they throw at him, that life throws at him? He overcomes. So if that's the Jesus, and it is, where is he at today? <coughs> Let's do a little kindergarten 101. Where is he at today? In us. in us. So is there anything hindering him today in us that's out in this world? He's reliving his life through you. That's why the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. He said, in that day you will know that I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, and I'm going to be in you. How is he being hindered today in you? He can't. And that's the, and you got to know that he cannot. Be, if he can't be hindered in this life, then you can't be hindered. You, your time died with him. You are in union with him. You're one with him. What's true of him becomes true of you. What he's called, what he's doing on earth, he's doing with you from from within. Okay, kingdom of God is where within us. Luke 17. It's within us. And so we're working together, never apart, never separate. I don't know where he begins and where I end anymore or where I begin, he ends. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm just letting the spirit flow through. That's called Zoe. That's the God kind of life. So when you have that mode, then nothing's impossible. That's why he said, when Peter said, Lord, who can be saved? He said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, what? All things are possible. That's we are we we don't have limitations anymore. All things are possible according to what he's saying and doing in your life. Now it's impossible for me to be the president of the United States. That's not going to happen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not that. Listen to what I'm saying. All things are possible with God who's in me, calling the shots. What's he saying? What's he doing? The minute I want to be the president without him, I'm in separation mode. It's got to be with him that all things are possible. Does that make sense? I know that we've, we've, we've hit this before. Now, let's look at this. Look at Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in him, Jesus, dwells what? All the fullness of the Godhead. That means in Jesus is all the Godhead, all the Father, all the Spirit, in the Godhead bodily, in his flesh. When Jesus walked this earth, he had the Godhead fully developed in him. Then he flips it in the next verse and says, and you are complete in him. Now, isn't that interesting? You want to look up that word complete? You say, yeah, but he has the fullness of the Godhead. He just says, I'm complete. Well, that doesn't do enough for you. Look up the word complete in the Greek. It means brought to fullness. He's saying the same thing about you that was true about him when he, when he was in the flesh on earth. So what is he saying then? You are complete. You're brought to fullness. 
filled to individual capacity, fully carrying the same thing Jesus did, you are caused to abound, here's another one, furnish or supply liberally to, liberally to fill to flood. You are flooded with fullness. You're just overflowing with the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit in you. So it, so you are right there that word he says in you. He said this is was this was Jesus, but let's talk about you. It's the same thing. You have that same fullness. Now, now when we're talking about dominion, then no weapon formed against you shall prosper. The gates of hell shall not prevail. You are an overcomer. Nothing overcomes you. In all things you triumph. Things don't triumph over you. All right. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Once you see who you are as your true identity. Now, in 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4, the next verse, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope. Now that this has happened and we're brought to completeness, we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Next. To an inheritance. So we have been raised from resurrection life. We've been raised to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that it does not fade away. It is reserved, for, reserved in heaven for us. So what he's saying, we've been raised to an inheritance. That boy, the older son, has an inheritance. And he didn't know it was freely given to him. He's working for it, and he doesn't... He's working for something he will never, ever get. Now back this story up a second. If it wasn't for that prodigal son leaving, he would never have had this conversation that all things are yours. It's because the prodigal son returned that made the boy question, I didn't, I didn't know who you are and I really don't know who you are now because of what you're doing with this, this younger brother, this son of yours. But it made him question and now he sees the Father even in a greater light. But can you imagine if he, if he didn't have this conversation, and this is where most Christians are, if he doesn't have this conversation with the Father, he will continue to work for it and never have it. What the Father say? You could have had a fattened calf any time. All things are yours. If he doesn't have that conversation, he's stuck in a work mode, a slave mode, not a sonship mode, but a slave mode of working and waiting to get something he already owns. Think about your bank account. If I put $1,000 in that bank account, it's there. It's there. Today, you know, you really can't do that. Remember in the old days, I could put any amount of money in anybody's bank account. Can't take it out and need an ID. <laughs> now you've got to have an ID to put money in. So that analogy goes awry. <coughs> But if I somehow magically could put money in your bank account and you got a thousand dollars there, now you don't know it's there. And if you don't know it's there, you'll never access from it. It will never manifest in your life. It stays there. Like, like, a, like a seed. This is there. It doesn't do anything. However, if your eyes are open to it, you can go and make what? A withdrawal. You don't got to beg that teller. Please let me have that money. I just found out that it's, that it's mine, that it's there. Please. And it, that, that's a ludicrous, but you know, in, in reality, what are we doing with God? Begging and bartering for things that's already in our inheritance that's been freely given to us. Romans 8, 32, 33. What are those two verses there? Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Now, the only way that you can know who you are... And see, these two boys have an identity crisis. They don't like who they are, and they don't like each other. And they probably don't like the father. And the only reason why they have a flawed identity is because they don't know who the Father is. Let me just take a, a sidebar here. I've said this a million times, but it's worth saying a million and one here. Let's go back 
to a two-year-old who gets abduct, abducted out of your sight at Walmart. Gone. They successfully take the kid, and they're in, they're in Cal and they, they go to California. You're here on the East Coast, they're on the West Coast, and you never see that kid again. And that kid, at two years old, doesn't know who mom and dad really is. They, they have an awareness of familiarity, but they can't articulate and fold, you know, this is my mom, this is my dad. So now, they don't know mom and dad, but when they get to three, four, now they'll begin to realize, I'm your mom, I'm your dad. But are they the mom and dad? Now, they're going to raise that kid with an identity that comes from their identity. How does racism happen? They learn it. This is not something you're born with. You learn racism. So if you're raised in a house, no matter what color, racism is reversible. It, everybody, it, 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 it walks through all walk of life. How, if, if you're raised with racist parents, you take on that. That's their identity. And they put that on you. Take, for instance, the, the royalty people in, the, in uh, the, the royal family. They raise their kids in royalty. And those kids act like royalty because that's the identity that they're raised with. Right? You're raised from, an, from believe it or not, you are raised from the identity that your parents have, that they put on you. This is how the world is. This is what you got to look out for. This is who we are. This, we're, we're, we're not of that kind over there. We are, you know, we're born on this side of the tracks. We're this kind of people. We're not for the likes of those people over there. And there's division, and there's stereotype, and there's class warfare, so forth and so on, that's happening in the world based on identity. Okay? That older brother has his own identity. And now he's identified his younger brother. Worthless, so forth and so on, right? And they don't know the identity of the father. So here's two boys acting nothing like the father. Because they don't know who the father is. And the scriptures tell us who the father is. If Jesus said this, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Right? Which we've done Thursday nights in Clarksburg. We've done that and we'll continue for the next week or so. But anyway, I want you to see that. Now, here's what we got to understand. When Paul, go back to Galatians 1. When Paul makes this statement in Galatians 1.16 that this is the purpose. Paul's going to get his identity from having Christ revealed in him. Now, some translations will say to him. As if God's up there and I'm down here, and then you know He's downloading stuff to me. No, nope. no. Nope. The Greek is in, I N. The Greek is E N, and it means I N in the English. It's in. I don't know why they don't have a revelation of oneness. They don't have a revelation, uh, uh, understanding of, of union. Therefore, they'll say two. Some translators say two, but the Greek is in me. So when Christ is revealed in me, and if I see Christ, I'm seeing the Father. Now I know who the Father is, and the Father is going to unveil who I am by looking at Jesus, which is the mirror representation, exact representation of who I am, because I'm one with him. As he is, so are we in this world, 1 John 4. All right? So what becomes the most important thing in your life? Here's where I want to go. It should be Christ dwelling in you. Paul, do you know a hundred and sixty times a hundred and sixty times in thirteen little epistles Paul uses that term in Christ or a variation of it in him of whom a hundred and sixty times he wants you to get something this whole thing is about Christ in me the hope of glory that's what he said in Colossians he said this mystery has been hidden for years for decades man has never seen this it's a mystery but I'll tell you what it is it's Christ in us. Christ in us. So the most important thing that I can preach and teach here is the indwelling Christ. So I put a little thing on Facebook and I said, when the pastor is more concerned about vision, see if I remember how I said it, the pastor is more concerned about vision than the indwelling Christ, this thing's upside down. We put the front and the back and the back and the front. Paul calls that perversion in, in Galatians 1.6 of, 
of the gospel is when you put anything in front, and especially law. But can you imagine putting a vision before Jesus? Do you understand the vision can only happen from the indwelling Christ within? The vision can only happen when you know your identity of the, of the indwelling Christ that's within. And most vision, believe it or not, is ambition. It's got nothing to do with God. It's ambition. And we've got to make sure, the church has to make sure that we keep Christ the centerpiece. Now he may call us to do this, that, and the other, but, my, but I can only fulfill that when my identity is right, and my identity can only be right if I keep the indwelling Christ as the main thing, which makes my identity right. We've got a lot of people with a flawed identity because of a flawed understanding of God, the Father, and we're out there doing crazy work. What do I mean by that? Is there a lot of judgmentalism today? A lot of condemnation? A lot of stuff. That doesn't, that doesn't come from the Father. Hate doesn't come from the Father. Unforgiveness doesn't come from the Father. But there's a lot of hate and there's a lot of unforgiveness. There's a lot of um, judgmentalism. There's a lot of division. 40,000 different denominations. Jesus is, You can't divide Jesus in 40,000 40, different pieces. One body, one head. How's it become 40,000 different pieces? Because we've, we've, we've messed this thing up. I'm going to tell you, the farm is in bad shape because we don't know who the Father is. The kingdom is not being expanded and it's not growing because Christians can't take dominion because they don't know who the Father is. Now, there's nuances to what I'm saying. I get that. Let's just take what I'm saying in general without nitpicking it to death. Get the, get the just of what I'm saying is that we've got a problem. Two boys who don't know the Father. A church who doesn't understand. That's all of us to a degree because we're looking through a glass darkly. So we press on, humbly press on to know Him. Isn't that what Paul says? Writes two-thirds of the New Testament says, I still don't know Him. To apprehend Him as he has apprehended me. 1 Corinthians 2.16. Is that the next one? For who has known the mind of the Lord? That he may instruct him. Okay, who? What two, what, which of the two boys knows the mind of the Father that the Father may instruct them? None of them. They don't know the Father because they don't have the mind to know the Father. Right? But Paul says, in the New Covenant, Christ in us, we have the mind of Christ. So I can know the Father through the mind of Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah. Look at the next verse. 1 Corinthians 3.20 And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows the thoughts of those who think they know. He knows the thoughts of the theologians. He knows the thoughts of the pre preachers and teachers. He knows the thoughts of the philosophers. He knows the thoughts of the wise, and they are worthless. Oh, he's sharp. He knows a lot. No, if, if he doesn't have the mind of Christ, he everything he knows is worthless. Watch what I get out of this, what I wanted you to get, is that Paul's saying, we have the mind of Christ. The minute we don't look at God through the lens of Christ, we're not seeing God rightly. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. I've got to see Jesus. He's now the one who helps me interpret Scripture of who the Father is, especially the Old Testament. Now, not just that. Check this out. If all my thoughts, even down to the one's thoughts I think about you, after I see some of the stuff we do to each other, and what you do out there. Reducing it clear down. I'm going somewhere there. This is the most important part of the message from here on in. If I don't take all my thoughts and the way I see what's happening in life, what's happening to me, what's happening in this church, what's happening around the world, what's happening in politics, if I don't take my thoughts, no matter how wise they are or how stupid they are, they're all worthless. Is that what it says? Unless I filter them through the mind of Christ. And that means my thoughts 
have to pass mustard with the Holy Spirit. And that's me treating Jesus as the tree of life, not the tree of knowledge, good and evil. Because I'm the world is the tree of knowledge, good and evil. We're hearing all this. So we got to take everything we know, everything we think we know, and we take it over to the tree of life, and God says, that ain't right. What you're thinking about that person, that's not me. I, I, I'm a forgiver. We forgive. See, remember the royalty? We don't, we don't act like that. That's not who we are. We don't eat at the table like that. We don't eat with elbows on the table. As little as that is, but to, to, to them, that's a big deal. Etiquette, right? Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does to us. Uh, that thought, that ain't me. Here's me, Jesus. So all my, what does it mean to have the mind of Christ? It means that I have the ability to take every thought of mine and filter it through the mind of Christ and see what comes out true and what comes out wayside. Not That's everything. If somebody does something to you, it's wrong. I'm not going to knee-jerk reaction this, the thing and, and say, I can't, but I, uh, and you know how we do. No, that hurt. That stung. That went out. Lord, what, 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 do you, what do you say? Well, I'm on the cross. And um, they're in the act of crucifying me. I'm, I'm minutes away from death. And I say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Hands down, it's over. Don't even go any further. Wallowing around with replaying in your head what they said, how they said it, and what the repercussions might be. It doesn't matter. They did it. Forgive it. Oh, no man, nothing but to what? Love them and move on because that's what Jesus is. That's, that's, what, that's who we are. This is not what we're going to do. That's, that's behavior modification. Who we are now is the grace and the union. My identity is I don't hold grudges. My identity is I freely forgive. Everything had... Now, which, which brings me to this. Jesus is the answer to everything. The person of Jesus. And this is where things get dicey and we separate. Because we are programmed for religion. And this thing is a union. It's a supernatural thing going on inside of you. It's not a religious thing out there that we work and try to do. So when I say we, we, we forgive, that's the nature. That's the transformation that's taking place within us of love and forgiveness. Because that's who the Father is. So if Jesus is the answer to everything, and the Bible says he's the sum of all things, I can reword that by saying Jesus answers everything. Take everything to Jesus. He's got an answer. And he'll answer you according to his nature, which is the truth. I could give you a million, a million ways to look at this, but then I'd be stepping on toes, and that's not what I want to do. I got my I, I take my stuff to Jesus. Stuff I even know what I need to do with. But the punch was so hard. The hit stung. And I'm like in a daze, and I'm not, I know what's right, but I still got to take what I know who Jesus is to Jesus to get the impartation, to get the grace that I need for that for that punch or whatever it, or what somebody said, what somebody did. I got to be able to handle that and handle it Christ-like, right? Because that's what supernaturally is going on in me. There is. This Christianity is, what Malcolm Smith says, 300% supernatural. There's no flesh and blood in it because flesh and blood doesn't inherit the kingdom of God. This whole thing is about Jesus. That's why he's the answer to everything, and he answers everything. I want you to get that. He, I can just say he, he's the answer to everything. But how does that get worked out? By looking at it this way. He answers everything. Everything going on, he answers. Yes and amen, or you get a rebuke, get thee behind me, Satan. You know what spirit I'm of. That's where we're at. And it's and, 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 and this is how we find our identity. This is who we are. Now watch where I go with this. John 16. I've got to hurry up. I'm almost done. Watch this. John 16. Watch this scripture. 
I have told you this, Jesus speaking to his disciples, I have told you this to keep you from falling away. You'll be thrown out of the synagogues. He says they're going to kick you out of church. They will kick you out of their fellowships. They'll kick you out of their little closed-knit groups. They'll delete you from Facebook. And put that up there. Yes, he says, a time is coming when the one who kills you, kills you. These are my brothers and sisters. These are people in the synagogue that I worship with every Saturday, putting it in that frame time. They're going to kill me? Yeah. Wow, how did we get there? He says, a time is coming when the one who kills you will think he's serving God. Who is this? This is the older brother. He does not want the kid back on the farm. He doesn't want him in the house, let alone on the farm, and in the house having a celebration eating that damn calf that is fatted that I've had my eye on all my life. He gets it. Right? You've got to put some flesh and blood on this because you're out there. They're kicking you out of fellowship. They're kicking you out of the synagogue because you're siding with Jesus and not with religion. But we've got to know how to respond back. What I want you to see is this boy is the spirit of religion that kills. It's the letter of the law, 2 Corinthians 3. It's a ministry of death and it kills. And they're going to think they're doing service for God. Do you remember the, 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 um, the speech the prodigal had prepared to say to the son or the, the father, Lord, I have sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. And then he's going to go on and say, but at least make me a hired hand and put me in the servant's quarters. At least my life will be better than where I just came from, the pigsty, right? right. What if the older brother would have met him and not the father? We've talked about this, but here, we'll check this out. The older brother would have loved to have heard that speech. And he would have accommodated him. And sent him right away to the servants' quarters. Hmm? And the church tells us we're, we're, we're not worthy, we're worms, we're, 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 we're nothing, and, and we're sinners, and better be thankful for what Jesus did because the angry God up there is going to get you. And thank God for Jesus. That's not how the prodigal, the father treated the prodigal as angry, upset. But that's what the older brother wants the father to treat him like. That's what the Pharisees and sat, scribes, that's what the whole parable was written for. Let me hurry up here. I don't want you to miss where I'm going to go with this. So, what the, product, what the older son wanted to do, this is where it's going to hit home with you, is put him in the servant's quarters and put him away. How many of us, if not yet, maybe down the road, and prepare? What did Jesus say? A time is coming. A time is coming. And every one of us will hit up against the wall of the older brother called religion. And they're going to cast you out of the synagogue. They're going to, they can't kill you today. They'd be in jail. But they will marginalize you. They will talk behind your back. They'll treat you a certain way where you won't feel welcomed anymore. And they'll hope you go away. What they're doing is what the prodigal wanted to do to that, or the older brother wanted to do to the prodigal. Here's, and if this is not happening to you yet, hopefully it won't. But what Jesus said, a time is coming. A time is coming. What they're going to say, you're a heretic. You believe that? We can't, be, we can't walk together anymore because you believe this, you believe that, or you've sinned, you've done something wrong. We don't like your lifestyle. We, don't, we look at your past and we don't, we, we, don't, we don't like what you used to do or what you did. And they'll write you off and they're going to put you in a box. They're going to duct tape that box, get you out of their sight, put you in some storage unit somewhere where there's spiders and it's dark and damp. Hopefully you'll never come back around because they've already written you off. That's, how the, that's what the older brother wanted to do to the younger brother. Write him off. When they're both sons. That's the key. They're both sons. So while they put you in a little box, 
and put you somewhere in some storage unit and, and out in the country somewhere, the bottom line is, who else did they do that to? Who's in me? They put me in a box, maybe. They, put, they cast you out of the synagogue. Who else did they cast you out of the synagogue? If they cast you out, who else gets cast out? Jesus. There you go. Now check that out. If they cast you out, they're casting Jesus out. You know why they can do that? You know why they can kill you and cast you out and do all that they do? Because they don't know who's in them. They don't know who's in them. Why? Because they don't know who the Father is. And they don't know who they are in the Father. And that's how we can treat each other like this. The older brother treating the younger brother because he doesn't know who the Father is. It's easy to treat people the way you see yourself. You see yourself load, do some self-hate on you, it's easy to hate on other people. But if you can see that you love yourself, then you can love other people. And we've been taught that we shouldn't love ourselves. But he says, love your neighbor as yourself. If you hate yourself, and I'm the epitome of self-hate growing up, and even recently, I get in that mode sometime and throw a pity party. But think about this. What part of me am I hating if I'm one with Christ? I don't know where I end and he begins. If I don't know where he ends and he begins because we're so tied tied together in union in one, I have absolutely no, no freedom or license or rhyme or reason to hate myself. I'm a new creation. I'm dead. I'm a new man. I'm a partaker of his divine nature. I'm one with him. To hate him, to hate you is to hate him and the work he's done and the call that he has. You were chosen before the foundation of the world, before you did anything good or evil. It's already, it's already done. That's what we get out of Esau and um, Jacob. The, he chose one, not knowing whether or not, it didn't matter what they were going to do. He chose based on his love for mankind. And Jesus is the chosen one that we're all in. He's the chosen man. It's another, it's another story, but I just want you to see that in case somebody thinks God's picking one over the other. He already made his pick. Okay? He's called Jesus. And you're included in that pick. Alright? What you do with that is whether or not you're blind or you've been awakened. One or the other. Now, because Christ is in us, these two boys, and here's where I want to close. These two boys, let's see if I can get this right. So you've got the you've got the tree of life. Don't worry, I'm not going to go there. I'm just showing you something. And then you got the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Alright, God has Adam and Eve. Okay, he says, don't eat from that tree. But there's the serpent who says, eat. God lied. It's not what he says. Now, how were these two created? In the image of God. In the image Likeness. and likeness of God. So they can't get, it. if they get any more like God, listen, they would be God. He created them a little lower than the Godhead. Elohim. A little lower than the Godhead. So if they got any more closer to God, they would be God. But they are considered little g gods. Okay? They can't get any... There's nothing missing and nothing broken here. You can't perfect what's... You can't perfect perfection. That's true. Okay? So what happens is the devil comes and says, God's lying to you. you, can, you he, he only knows that if you eat from this tree, you'll be like him. They were already like him, after the likeness and image of God. So I had this message already, ready to go, um, yesterday morning. Got it all done, did the outlines, all that. And I get on the Facebook, and uh, one of our friends, what's her name? Uh, Lisa. Yeah, Lisa what? Wentworth. Um, some, and I don't remember her last name, but that's... Anyway, got a lot of good stuff up there. But she puts up there... Um, 
I don't know if I shared it on Tree of Life. I can't remember. But in, in Genesis chapter 3, in the Young's Literal Bible, or the Concordant one, I believe. But I have, I have both. I only checked it in Young's. I looked it up. She was right. When, when God went looking for Adam and Eve after they ate from this tree, okay? Mm -hmm. Do you know what she says to God? It's not what your Bible says. But in the literal, because there's no literal, but the literal of what we have, and that's what Young's is, a literal interpretation and a concordant text, um, concordant translation, um, are literal. You know, they're, the, 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 um, they're not adding things in there to make it fluid, and that's why it's choppy. But Eve's response to God was, did I write it down? I'm going to make sure I get it right. The serpent made me to forget. And so I ate. Boom. That's it. Don't add nothing in there. He says, why did you eat from that tree? The serpent made me forget. And so I ate. Forget what? We know that it wasn't God said not to eat from that tree. She didn't forget that because that's what she said to the serpent. When he said eat, she says, the Lord God said that we should eat from, from this tree, right? right? So she didn't forget that. What did she forget? Who she was. Likeness, she forgot her likeness and image. She forgot her identity. Her likeness and image of God. And he got her. The first sin is not eating the apple, which wasn't an apple. The first sin was the unbelief that came from forgetting who they were. And the enemy capitalized on getting them to forget their identity and make them think that they weren't who they were and eat from this to become what they forgot who they were. They thought this would restore their image that they had forgotten because he made them forget. What's the older brother doing to the younger brother? Trying to get him to forget sonship. This son of yours. He ain't, in other words, he ain't your son, and he ain't my brother. As Malcolm says, if his heaven is my heaven, then my heaven is his hell. I'm done with him, and you should be too. So what happened is the older brother wants the younger brother to forget who he is. And go to those slave quarters. Or at least, hey, go back to the pigsty. You don't belong here. That's how the community would have handled him if the, brother, if the father didn't run out there and get him. Community got a hold of him first. That's another story. But you understand what's happening here? Religion wants to keep saying to you how worthless you are. Not you, not yet. There's more to do. You got to do that. Well, you'll never get there. Or when, you, or or they just judge you from your past and lock you up in your past, and that's over. They put you in a box and put you in some storage, and you're done. They don't want you around anymore. And if your name comes up, they, got, they ain't got nothing nice to say. Or that you, you're, you're believing. A.W. Tozer, I told you what he said. The closer I get to God, the less evangelical friends I have. What happened? He was getting revelation from the, from the Father that was not evangelical. And people started backing off from him. From, what he's, from the quote, the less evangelical friends I have. Meaning that he was probably setting his compass toward truth that didn't come from his own tribe. The evangelical world, the Western church. So the enemy and religion, using religion, which is the older brother, is never going to tell you who you really are. They're always going to tell you you're not in the sanctuary. You need to work to get in you're in the sanctuary. Working for something you already have. Earning God's love when it's freely given to you. It's called unconditional love agape. Here's where we close. Summary. Real quick. Here's the deal. Here's what I want you to get out of this. Know the Father. Because knowing the Father, you see yourself. He loves you, you love yourself. He loves you, you love others. He forgives you, you forgive others. You, you, you know the Father by looking at Jesus. Once you understand, that's identity. One and two, or A and B is identity. Three is, you now realize, now that I know that I'm a son or daughter, 
I'm in the family of God. I've been raised to an inheritance, and all things are mine. I ain't working for nothing. It's all been freely given to me. And then I go. I work the farm. I go out and do the Father's business. I do Jesus, and I do dominion. That's what we do Jesus, and we do dominion. We already got it. I ain't taking it. I already have it. I'm not trying to become Jesus. I'm one with him. If I'm lacking in anything, it's I'm looking through a glass darkly still. And I need messages like this. I need messages of, of, the, of the people that are out there. That's what we put on the tree of life. We don't put doctrines on the tree of life. We put Christology. It's about Jesus. And we understand Jesus by the Trinitarian faith. Trinitarian faith, Christology, and it's all about the indwelling Christ. You're not going to hear anything else. If God gives me a vision, it will, you, you, you may never even know it. Because I'm too busy preaching Jesus to, to, to waste my time talking about a vision that won't even be fulfilled anyway without the indwelling Christ and my identity fulfilling it. Does that make sense? All right, so let me say one more thing. That's church. You can't let anything in your individual life, your personal life, politics, can't come before Jesus. I'm telling you, we had this conversation. I said, there's somebody I'm saying, I wish they would know theology, Jesus, like they know their politics. I'm like, man, they just know everything going on politically. And they're Christians. But I wish they could flip that and know Jesus like they know their politics. Because when you get to heaven, there ain't no Democratic Party. And there ain't no Republican Party. And there ain't no vote. Your life is all about the indwelling Christ, not this add-on stuff that's world emphasis, flesh emphasis, kingdom of darkness emphasis. It's not the kingdom of God. And if money, if you're out there, money, 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 sorry. Christ within has to be more to you than money, more to you than a career. More to you than your spouse. Hmm? Jesus said, when I came, I come, I, I brought a sword. I brought a sword to the family. Meaning that if a family, if you put the family member in a place other than, what do you say? Let the dead bury the dead. That's my dead. Let the dead bury the dead. If he who puts his hand upon and looks back, you're, you're not making it about me. He, Christ, is the sum of all things. He must have preeminence in all things. I'm not saying these things are wrong. Money's not wrong. Spouse ain't wrong. Education ain't wrong. Career ain't wrong. But they are on the back burner to what I'm really about. He, I am, I am about, and Richard Murray said it. And when he said it, I don't know how long ago it was, a couple months ago. Man, I just jumped up. He said, we need to be obsessed about the nature of Jesus. That's a simple statement, but profound. Man, yes, yes. Why are we are we really worshiping Jesus? Or are we worshiping worship? Are we worshiping because it's the church thing? What worship is not worship unless it's out of a revelation of who the Father is in Jesus. And the more revelation I get, the more pure my worship becomes, and then the work and dominion is right. So let's go do Jesus and do dominion and let's get on with the farm. Let's get this farm healthy. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, no, no more of this prodigal stuff going on. To, both sons are both sons. They're both sons. They treat each other the way they are, out of their true identity. Paul says, no, no man after the flesh. We know him after the spirit now. Christ in them. Let's stand. Frank, if you want to hand out the elements.
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus, the Logos, the word, capital W. We thank you for the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We're not talking about the Bible, but even written. In the beginning, there was no Bible. He's the word. So let's lift up the bread this morning. And let's partake of the divine nature we're one with. Lord, open the eyes of our understanding. Give us a spirit of revelation of Christ in us, the hope of glory, who is our everything, and he answers everything. Let's partake. It doesn't matter what Adam did in the garden, Adam and Eve. It's not on us. It doesn't affect us. He's made us worthy. He's raised us to newness of life. And we are in him. We're nothing like the first Adam. We've got nothing in common with the first Adam. All that came out of that, sin and death, doesn't touch us. Doesn't touch us. We have been redeemed from the effects of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. We don't get our identity from who our family. We don't get our identity from our culture. We don't get our identity from politics. We don't get our identity from church, religious church. We get our identity from the head, and that's Christ. Christ alone identifies you and me. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John flips it and says, as he is, so are you. You're there, complete in him. Furnished to the hilt of the Godhead. Where you don't know where you end and he begins. Let's partake.